If you are in the low category for your age group, you have a 400% chance of dying over the next decade. You could be a ticking time bomb. Nine out of the 10 top killers in America are related in some way to being too fat and being metabolically unhealthy. The most clear predictor of health when you are 70 years old was the quality of your relationships when you were 50 years old. You know, for me personally, I have seen the absence of meaning, I think even cause death in some way. Imagine a life not just marked by years, but by how vibrant, fulfilling, and healthy each of those years are. Today, we're diving into a concept that will redefine your approach to health and fitness. They will help you create a foundational blueprint to create a life that's not only longer, but richer in every sense. We're gonna give you seven pillars that you can use to inform your daily decision-making that are gonna have long-term, long-lasting effects on your life that are gonna give you more energy, you're gonna look better, you're gonna feel better, you're gonna perform your best, you're gonna live more healthy years, and along the way, you're going to be more engaged with life. Hey everybody, I am Jack Murphy. I am the co-founder of Rebel Health Alliance, and we are back today again, me and Dr. Deep here to bring you new information, tips and tricks, dive deep into the health industry, talk about all the things that are related to you, to us in the world of health and fitness. Dr. Deep, how are you, buddy? Who are you and why are you here? Jack, great to be with you today again. I am Dr. Deep. I am the Chief Medical Officer, co-founder of Rebel Health Alliance. We are here for our uh, next discussion on a great topic, something that we get asked about a lot, basically, in how do I just start? How do I live my healthiest life? There's so much information out there. There's so many different places to go. So we wanted to boil it down into a digestible sort of format for all of us to, to really understand. I feel like growing up when I was a kid, nobody ever said to me, you should be lean. Kind of a lot of us were just naturally back then. It seemed to be a lot easier to stay lean when we were younger. The environment was different. But you look around at everybody, and there's just obese people everywhere. Half the country is overweight, 40% are obese or whatever, and the trends are going like this. So it seems like this message of get and stay lean is being lost on everyone. First thing is, is like, what does it mean to be lean? Yeah, I think it's a great question and something that we we have used different kinds of measures for over the uh, you know course of science. BMI is one that often physicians will talk to you about. You know, fitting in that category, twenty five to thirty, you're considered overweight, and thirty and above, you're obese. There are a lot of opinions on BMI. There are a lot of reasons why it may or may not apply. Someone like you, Jack, are, are a good example of a body habitus where BMI is a little tricky to sort of. Uh, really understand. And so there's really a gold standard that that we're all just trying to get at, whether it's using calipers or waist circumference or BMI, what we actually care about is what is your per body fat percentage? And that's broken down into a few different categories. For men, the optimal body fat percentage that is correlated with the uh, lowest mortality and morbidity, the, the lowest development of chronic diseases downstream is somewhere between 12 and 18%. You know, that 15% mark or so is a healthy, lean body mass. Um, for women, that percentage is a little bit higher, typically in the 20% range, 18 to 22 or so is the number that we go. You know, you can be too lean as well. And, you know, once your body fat percentage starts dropping into the five and 6%, seven and 8% range, you can have major disruptions in things like your hormones and your steroid uh, development. And, and, and there's, you know, thermogenesis and metabolism. And, and so there are a lot of uh, impacts to being too lean as well or too skinny. But when we talk about being lean, it's really about shedding excess adipose tissue, excess fat. Uh, we can talk about the different kinds of fats and, and what's most important and how we actually understand those things from a gold standard standpoint, but that's really the goal you're shooting for. About 15% for men, about 20% for women. It's not just about vanity, though. 
right? This is not just about looking good. There's a real reason why we want you to be lean. What are some of the negative consequences of being not lean enough, i.e. too fat? You can be, quote unquote, in the normal BMI range, but have a body fat percentage or a visceral body fat uh, that are putting you at, at real risk for chronic disease. Having a high visceral fat, for example, and, and this is something to unpack. This is the fat that's really wrapped around your organs in, inside your body. It is uh, considered pro-inflammatory. It uh, is what leads to things like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease as it infiltrates into your liver and causes all sorts of problems there, puts us at higher risk for development of diabetes, cardiovascular risk, hypertension, strokes, heart attack. So, you know, we know that having excess adipose does that to us. Again, we have real reasons to have fat in our bodies, but uh, you're trying to really dial into those percentages we talked about before. You don't want to be too fat because it's basically like a disease environment. It's like a Petri dish for making you sick. Every, what is it? Is it nine out of the 10 top killers in America are related in some way to being too fat and being metabolically unhealthy? And let me share with you a personal story. When I first got involved with the RHA project, we got my visceral fat analyzed. I went and got a DEXA scan and I had something like 4.5 pounds of visceral fat. I always had walking around there like a, like a bulge in my belly. And I used to, my wife would be like, hey, you know, what's up with that bulge in your belly? I'm like, oh, it's just from my uh, anterior pelvic tilt, right? I was just blaming it on the fact that maybe my body was sticking out a little bit. No, I had like almost five pounds of visceral fat. And I did not know that until I went and got a DEXA scan. I get the DEXA scan. And basically, I found out that all of my internal organs were just wrapped in fat. And fat was like all twisted up inside of there. And it's a different kind of disgusting fat that makes you sick. And I realized I had to make a change immediately with that. And through a combination for me that worked was intermittent fasting and lowish carbs, high intensity interval training and resistance training for sure. I was able to get that visceral fat number down to like 0.5 pounds. I probably put 10 years on my life with that. So thank you, Rebel Health, for, for making me see by looking inside with the DEXA scan and like really getting motivated to make the change when I just saw it right there on the report. And that's why the measurement systems are so important. Yeah. One point about that, Jack, you mentioned the DEXA scans, you know, we talked about this in our last show around the state of sick America and how the health gangsters prevent you from being your best self. Understanding this, you know, you go to your, your primary care doc and you get weighed and you get your height measured and they tell your BMI is normal and they tell you to go on your way. You're, could be a ticking time bomb. You personally reducing your visceral fat by an order of magnitude from five pounds to 0.5 pounds, literally probably added a decade to your life if you can maintain that for the rest of your life. You know, we don't even measure those things though. Insurance companies often don't pay for that. And so our patients are, are asked to kind of pay out of pocket for this because the information is so important. And it is so eye-opening when you realize what's actually happening on the inside. Let's talk now about one of the components of being lean that's really helpful is being strong. The second pillar for longevity is get strong. So we've got get lean. Now, get strong. Deep, what do we mean by get strong and why is it important? We have what I believe is a epidemic of sarcopenia in our country, a loss of muscle mass. Each of us can expect to lose something like 10% of our muscle mass over time. And so 30, 40 years from now, if you're 30 or 40% weaker than you are now, consider what you're able to do now and what that might mean downstream. So having muscle and being functional more than anything, I think, is the goal for all of us and what we talk about with our patients. But 
we can unpack this a little bit more. Even more, we are understanding the many benefits of resistance training on some of the same markers we talked about earlier, things like blood pressure, lipids, insulin sensitivity, et cetera. I think that's something that people can really sink their teeth into today. You know, I, I, I know, I admit it's hard sometimes, just like it's hard to put away money saving for your retirement when you're 35 years old, you're thinking about 40 years from now or whatever, but you got to make this investment in the bank. I know it's hard sometimes to think about those extended end of life time period where you want to build muscle to prevent the decline of and the in, onset of sarcopenia. But today, the more muscle mass you have today, there's very distinct benefits. You can you can eat a little bit more because muscle is a denser uh, tissue than fat and you it burns more calories. It helps absorb your carbohydrates that you eat. It improves your insulin sensitivity. It helps lower your blood pressure today, which makes you feel better. And then you can also just get out and do more things. Are there any other sort of blood markers or existing current health benefits that we didn't cover. I mean, it improves basically everything. You're right, Jack. And and so much so the American Heart Association just put out a great scientific statement uh, just a couple of weeks ago on the very many benefits of resistance training. So if we look at a few of them, you mentioned a few of them, improvements in blood pressure, blood glucose, blood lipids, improvements in endothelial function, cardiorespiratory function, fitness, decrease in inflammatory markers and blood clotting, sleep quality, depression, anxiety, quality of life. These are all objective measures that we've seen across hundreds and thousands of pooled studies, including millions of participants over decades of research. That's what's put into these scientific statements. It's irrefutable now. You know, I, I say this sometimes on social media. It's not lifting weights is not about just getting jacked and again for vanity. You know, one, functionally, we should all want to make sure that in 40 years, we can climb up a flight of stairs and put a suitcase in the overhead compartment above us. That takes muscle. But we also understand how much each of these various measures are, are driven by actual muscle mass. Um, even things like bone density, we, we talk about you know compression fractures, doing resistance training puts tensile force on our muscles, which recruits more bone matrix deposition. So you know the benefits go on and on. I think, one thing to consider is that you don't have to go join Gold Gym or go to Venice Beach or whatever and be like amidst a, a bunch of meatheads or identify with that culture. Literally, what we mean is true resistance training, meaning you can do great resistance training with just bands in your home or light weights in your home or body weights. There's definitely something to be said about progressive overload and the kind of benefits that, you know, gyms offer us and, and the various kind of movements and muscles that we can target. But I do find that sometimes patients are a little bit overwhelmed on where to start when it comes to building muscle. Uh, so we don't shy away from this for for anyone, whether it's it's women or seniors or, you know, anyone in between the recommendation is still the same that we need to be objectively putting on lean body mass uh, as you know measured by our composition and, and through DEXA scans. I think you really make a good point. Lifting is not for meatheads only. Lifting weights is for your school teacher. Lifting weights is for everyone. And again, it can be body weight, it can be lightweight resistance. But progressive overload, where it's a little bit more or a little bit more, few more reps each time, is the key to actually building strength and muscle mass. All right, get strong, get lean. We've got that. Next one up, the next pillar of longevity is move more. Cardio fitness. That's what we're talking about here when we say move more. So that could mean like walking more, it could mean jogging more, it could mean swimming more. 
could be running, cycling, could be rucking, could be a million things. But what we're getting at here is raising your heart rate through activity. And I think you mentioned the gold standard for really understanding where your cardio fitness level is, is the VO2 max test. I've taken one of those. It's crazy. You get in the, in, in the science lab and they put a mask on your face and they basically tell you to keep exercising. For me, it was rowing at a faster and faster and faster and faster rate until you literally are absolutely dead, 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 dead. All you've got in the tank exhausted. And the whole time they're measuring what and what is the value, Dr. Deep, in understanding what the VO2 max test is telling you. The VO2 max test, Jack, is one of the most comprehensive single digits that we can follow in healthcare. You know, we just did a great seminar for all of our patients. We have exclusive monthly uh, education, long format discussions where we get into the real science and data behind this. Patients ask us questions. We give them tips. But uh, here's the summary. VO2 max, like you said, is a measure of the milliliters of oxygen being, presume, being consumed per kilogram per minute in your body. So what is that actually measuring? That is measuring a complex series of phenomena from how well your respiration, how well your heart is pumping blood, how well your lungs are oxygenating that blood, how well your arterial system is delivering that blood to your peripheral skeletal tissues, how well those tissues and those cells are then extracting oxygen. And ultimately, what we're actually measuring with that is how much mitochondria is, how much oxygen is the mitochondria using in order to produce more ATP, which is the currency of our cells. In order to do more work, you need more ATP. And so that's really what we're measuring with the VO2 max. The reason, Jack, that this is so important is because of how highly correlated this is to longevity, to morbidity, to mortality. Uh, here, here's some stats. If you have an elite level VO2 max for your age range, and it's different by age and by uh, by sex. Like you said, you get on the on the treadmill or the bike or the rower and we check a baseline and we sort of see how high you can actually get until your body sort of taps out. If you are in a the low category for your age group versus someone who is in the elite category for your same age group, you have a 400 percent chance, higher chance of dying over the next decade, four times more likely to die than a counterpart who was well-trained, who had a high VO2 max. Let's compare that to something like being a lifelong smoker or having diabetes, both of which confer about a 40% mortality risk over the next decade versus someone who doesn't. So being in a low VO2 max category puts you at 10 times higher the risk of death over the next decade than even having diabetes or smoking for lifetime does. It shows you how important this single metric is as a overall marker of our health. So what do we do? You got to find something that you like to do, guys. You got to like to walk. You got to like to run. You got to like to row or swim or play tennis or whatever it is. Play golf. If you play golf and walk 8,000 yards, that's pretty good. So incorporate this into your daily life. You will live longer. Your kids will see more of you. You will play with your grandkids and you won't be a burden on them later in life if you move more. Once you start moving, guys, it's going to get a lot easier. I know it might be scary to get up off the couch and get moving, but you have to do it. I promise you it'll change your life. It is one of the core pillars for a reason. This is all backed up by science. There's a million studies with a million people over a million years. We're not just blowing smoke. Please move more, get strong, get lean. What's next? 
sleep well. Dr. Deep, I know there were times in my life where I thought sleep wasn't that important, where I thought it was fun to be a night owl, or I thought I was really doing a good job by burning the candles at both ends. But I've come to learn that sleep is essential. Tell me about sleep. Tell me why we just don't even think about it sometimes, take it for granted. What does it mean to sleep well? And what does it do for us? Well, Jack, I think sleep is the underrated hack in most of our lives, especially in our modern society. You know, it's almost romanticized to not need that much sleep. People brag about being able to run off of four or six hours. You know, people use the lines like I'll sleep when I die and all sorts of things like that. As a physician and a, you know, as a, a young clinician, as a resident, you know, sleep is is something we don't think about. We do 36 hour shifts and we're in the hospital kind of just rolling. But, you know, one of the first sort of eye-opening experiences and data points that I saw around sleep is, is actually during medical training, they did studies on medical residents and they realized that our decision-making and our logic uh, after a 24-hour shift were essentially... Uh, just as impaired as if we had a blood alcohol level of 0.1 or something like that. So after that, I really started to understand how important sleep was to, to most of our lives. And once you actually start looking into the data, you realize that it is something that is completely underappreciated in, in most of our lives. So what is good sleep look like? You know, we know that somewhere between seven and a half and nine and a half hours is what's needed for most people. We need a healthy breakdown, though, of uh, different categories of sleep, meaning we need about 20% of our sleep to be in that restorative category where we're actually going down into our delta and gamma waves. Uh, that's where a lot of the sort of cellular cleanup happens, uh, the autophagy in our neurons, uh, where we uh, start to really crystallize a lot of our thoughts. And same thing with REM sort of um, as part of that category in that restorative sleep. We ask all of our patients to measure this using something like a whoop band. I've got mine on here that that really does a good job of, of tracking uh, sleep for us. We can talk a little bit more about the many downstream impacts of both poor sleep and, and healthful sleep as well. I used to have a lot of problems sleeping. I've had sleep apnea for a long time and didn't, didn't really know it. And I would struggle all night in bed, choking and like not really getting any restful sleep. And I, I, I knew going to sleep at night, I, I said, all right, time to go to war. Like going to sleep was going to war. It was terrible. And I'd wake up feeling dumb and sluggish ever since I got the sleep study done and got a CPAP and I can sleep all night. I have woken up feeling like I've got an extra 20 IQ points on me. I feel sharper. I feel cleaner. I feel more awake. I have more energy. I'm more um, emotionally stable. And there's just a million reasons why sleep is the most fundamental thing that we can do here. Every new life, you know, health journey should start with focusing on your sleep. Get your sleep first. Nothing good happens after 10 p.m. Anyway, get your butt to bed, get eight to nine hours of sleep, wake up and do your cardio, and your life will change. I know it seems kind of dumb to think about sleep and talk about how important it is. It's changed my life focusing on my sleep, and I want you to do that too. Now that we're sleeping well, we're moving well, we got stronger, we got leaner. How do we keep this machine all fueled up? We got to eat right too. Isn't that, isn't that right, doctor? Got to eat right. Tell me about that. Eating well, Jack, this is probably one of the most complicated and difficult pillars to really talk about because eating well means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Ultimately, I think we mean how do you eat in a healthful, sustainable way for you that allows you 
to achieve the rest of the pillars in your life that allow you to be your best self, that allow you to get lean and get strong and sleep well, what does that diet look like for you? I think the key thing to think about here is that there's no exact one size fits all prescription for diet. And in fact, the DNA test and blood work that we offer in our practice will help you understand exactly what the right diet is for you. But there's just certain things that you can look at. There's markers that you can assess to see if your dietary choices are working for you. Now, I'll make one caveat. Protein. You need protein to build muscle mass and maintain muscle mass. So really, I think that's like a core component of any diet we're talking about is getting enough protein. But if you want to do a little bit of this or a little bit of that, as long as your blood work is good, as long as your blood pressure is good, as long as you aren't fat, as long as you aren't skinny fat, as long as you have muscle mass, and as long as you have the energy to get about your day and you're sleeping right and you're moving your bowels in a frequent and consistent manner, then that diet works for you. Dr. Deep, what personal diet works for you? And have you seen the results in your blood work, in your body composition, in your energy levels, in your sleep quality? What works for you? So Jack, I have a very strong family history of diabetes and heart disease. Both my parents, three of my grandparents had diabetes. Uh, South Asian men have terrible cardiovascular profiles and risk. And so those are the things I'm really thinking about as I'm thinking about my diet and, and how to eat well to power the machine in order to be lean and to be strong and to be sleeping well and to have purpose. So much like you, and I think much like most of America, we probably overconsume carbohydrates uh, in the form of sugar and processed carbohydrates. So again, it, it's going to be very individualized. I also found that intermittent fasting with low carb was the first initial step for me. I think the most important takeaway. One of the most important takeaways from this section is that there's no one good right diet for everyone. And there's no one right diet even for your own life for the rest of your life. And that's why I think that those who are quite dogmatic around, you know, carnivore or keto or vegan and just basically, you know, uh, putting one macro above all else it doesn't make sense for the entirety of their life. There's a much, much more complex biochemistry happening, just like you mentioned, Jack, as for both of us, as we started to lose fat and improve our muscle mass uh, through things like intermittent fasting and low carbohydrate diet and making sure we're getting plenty of protein and doing all the other things we just talked about, we start to see metabolic changes in our lives, like improved insulin sensitivity, like leptin sensitivity, like hunger cues and an ability to, you know, regulate and be metabolically adaptable to different kinds of foods. And so over time, you're very right that that may shift. And if you're really in a cutting mode, it's important to plan everything out in advance. Plan it out, map it out, even do meal prep. You will be grateful. I know it sounds like a pain in the ass at first, but you will be grateful once you start seeing the pounds melt off, the fat melt off. In fact, people will kill me for this, but the food pyramid isn't really all that far off. If you eat rice and a little bit of pasta and then some proteins and dairy and then your fruits and vegetables and then you don't eat a lot of sugar and don't eat a lot of saturated fats, Hey, you're going to be, you're going to be okay. Now we're going to talk about two pillars of longevity that may not be ones that you would first think about. The first one is build community. It is shown through a number of studies that humans who participate in a community, this is have strong social connections where you share common values, common interests, common activities are likelier to be happier, healthier, and wealthier. Studies show four out of five dentists recommend community 
to help you in all of these elements of life. And that is because humans are social creatures. We have evolved to work together in groups for better outcomes for everyone else. So when we engage in the types of behaviors that create and generate community, we get a response inside of us that makes us feel good. So when you do community type based activities, you feel good. And when you do community, you actually turn out to be happier, healthier, and wealthier. Dr. Deep, have you seen this in your experience personally, community building, whether it's been a lack of community in patients or people in isolated geographic regions or people who are mentally isolated? And in your own life, what kind of benefits have you seen from community? Yeah, Jack, as you mentioned, human beings are fundamentally social creatures. We evolved in communities and societies. We relied on one another. We trust one another. We form close, often monogamous, decades-long relationships for uh, the betterment of our progeny and our species. And so it's hardwired into our DNA, whether we like it or not, to be part of community. I think our modern day has really driven a wedge into community. It's kind of created pockets of isolation, even in the densest areas where we used to socially interact with everyone, whether it's going to the grocery store and talking to the cashier or ordering food or you know being out in, in public, you had to engage in civic discourse in order to just live your life with automation and with computers and everything that we're seeing now, increasingly we are seeing more and more social isolation. And this isn't just about, you know, like hugging one another and having friends, you know, this is about our actual health and longevity. Uh, one of my favorite studies of all time, Jack, is the uh, Harvard study of adult men. And this took uh, two groups of peop uh, young people in Boston. One was uh, a group of young men who were from the poorest neighborhoods in Boston, and one were sophomores at Harvard University. And the theory was, well, those who are at Harvard probably have all sorts of connections and, uh, you know, uh, improved a lot in life and, and started off with many more um, opportunities than those living in the poorest neighborhoods. And they followed these folks for 75 years. They did things like physical, um, you know, strength tests and blood work and mental health questionnaires. And they found some very striking things. They found that the most clear predictor of health when you are 70 years old was the quality of your relationships when you were 50 years old. More than cholesterol, more than blood pressure, more than any of these other kind of hard objective medical outcomes that we look at, having quality relationships predicted longevity much more than any of the other things that we have. And we see this play out in all sorts of different ways. Like you mentioned, you know, people who are in relationships live longer, people who have children live longer, people who have community live longer and are are healthier. And and so, you know, there's real data to support why finding connection and finding community are important. I personally have found that I'm at my best when I'm surrounding myself with people I love, when I'm engaging with many different kind, groups of people in my own life, that it brings me joy, but we also know that it helps prevent things like Alzheimer's. It, it brings down our blood pressure, it helps reduce cortisol levels, and it, it directly feeds into our next pillar on, on having sort of purple uh, or, or personal purpose in life as well. So having community, Jack, is one of the most important things we can do in life. Personally, for me, when I have gone through a crisis in my life, I will reflect back to my divorce in 2009. I was a total mess afterwards. And one of the things that completely saved me was I joined two local communities right by my new apartment in the city. I joined a CrossFit gym and I joined a yoga studio. And I went to both of those places every, you know, at least one of them every day. I got to know all of the people who were there. 
they had events that I went and attended to. I went on retreats. I did competitions. We had parties. We had barbecues. We went out for cocktails. We had brunch. That was amazing to me for my, not only my physical and mental health from the exercise, but from just having that human interaction, it uplifted me. It helped me process through the trauma of that terrible time in my life. It introduced me to new friends, opportunities, experiences, opportunities that I have still nurtured to this day, 13, 14 years, 15 years, 15 years later. And it saved my life. And that was when I really learned personally firsthand the power of community. And I have spent the better part of my time online building communities. And I've even traveled around the country, like hosting brunch events to just bring people together to have that community. And I'll tell you what, to a single person, every single person that came to one of those brunches left with a smile on their face and like warmth in their heart. Because being around people who share your values, who share your interests and have common goals with you, just it just makes you feel better. Dr. Deep, in your experience, what have you seen, especially I can think of in end of life folks or in your practice, where not having purpose has either led to positive outcomes or negative outcomes? Because I have a personal story I can share as well. Yeah, Jack, I think for better or worse, as a physician, I have the great honor of seeing people in some of their best moments and and some of their worst. And what I find pretty consistently is that in those worst moments, the folks that find a way through and that battle through always had community but they had a broader purpose. They had an individual vision for what they were going to accomplish in this life. They understood why they were here and who they were to their community and the people that relied on them. I think we have lost our ability to, as, as a community and as a society, to hold responsibility and accountability. And, and when you really think about purpose, it's both what do we really believe is important and the change we want to see in this world, but it's also what do we live for and who are the people that are sort of relying on us? And that kind of support and belief and community and purpose plays out in really interesting ways with people and in their states of crises, like you mentioned at the end of life or even with a terminal condition or, or, or disease. I, I see the power of belief in, in all sorts of ways. And often when you're pairing your purpose and having a vision for why you want to be here for much longer, you find really amazing ways to dig deep and get through whatever you're getting through. Uh, so not having a sense of purpose, kind of floating through life, you know, not understanding what your particular role here is, I think has more profound impact than we actually realize on our mental health, on our sense of anxiety and, and stability and, and things like depression. We have studies that actually show that folks that have a true core sense of purpose and mission in this life tend to have better cardiovascular outcomes, have longer, happier lives, have better relationships. Um, and so, you know, I think we all need to find and dig deep in and, and give ourselves goals and give ourselves something to feel proud about, you know, building rebel health with you, Jack, has been a purpose. I think we both feel that very strongly every day. It helps us get through any of the moments of doubt and and worry and gives us a, a, a real reason to kind of get up every day. And that motivation has rippling impacts on all the rest of the pillars as well. Uh, by having purpose, 
you have a reason to get strong and to get lean and to move more and to sleep well and to be here and to have purpose and community and it all kind of fits in together. So uh, I hope many of those out there watching can, you know, dig deep and find their own purpose and realize that it, it has really profound impact on their health and longevity. You know, for me personally, I have seen the absence of meaning, I think even cause death in somebody. My grandmother, she was married to her husband, my grandfather, for over 60 years. Her mission in life was to take care of him. And her health was totally fine. He died, and within a year, she had completely disintegrated, basically. Her mental health completely went, her physical health, and she just basically deteriorated into an agonizing and, and miserable death, to be honest. And as soon as he died, it was just over for her. Her meaning was completely gone. It's really the most important thing that we have. Viktor Frankl lived through a friggin' concentration camp because he discovered what his meaning was. If a guy can survive a concentration camp because he figured out what his meaning was and it kept him going, his, his why, then we can figure out what our meaning is and we can persevere. Yeah, startup life can be tough, but... When I think about the fact that we're actually helping people live longer, better lives, spend more time with their children, you know, look better, feel better, perform better, just generally add a sense of awesomeness to their life. That's what gets me going and it gets me so amped up. So that's my meaning. And when I discovered that meaning in the last or for this particular time of my life, I, it instantly just snapped me into action and it has been the guiding light of everything that I'm doing. And you're right. It, it gives you the reason to get and stay lean, to be strong, to move more, to eat right, to sleep well. And then you have a community that comes around this purpose that you can find. So you may not have expected purpose to be one of the seven pillars of longevity after we spent the beginning talking about not being fat and getting strong and working on your VO2 max and doing your cardio and eating the right foods and being metabolically healthy and improving your mitochondrial function, you know, but having community and building purpose is the thing that is going to help you do all of those other things. There's no reason really to do any of this other stuff unless you have, unless you have meaning in your life. And for, for me, and for so many of our members as well on this, the health journey they're on is to your children, right? Like meaning in your life is, is your kids because you want to be there for them. You want to teach them as best as you can through example. You want to have as much energy as you can to be uh, a part of their lives. And eventually you want to be there for your grandchildren as well. So find the thing that's important to you and only you are going to know what it is. I can't give you meaning. Deep can't give you any meaning. But once you find it, just put it right in front of you and just drive towards it all the time. And all the rest of the stuff will become easy because you'll have a real reason to do it. So find your why.